You are told that there are no longer parties among us. The lion and the lamb lie down together in peace. Do not believe a word of it. The same parties exist now as they ever did. That was a letter from Thomas Jefferson to Albert Gallatin around the time of the election of 1824. And joined, as always, here on the Liberty Versus Power podcast, Dr. Patrick Newman, author of Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in America, 16. 16- 07 1849. Patrick, this election is very interesting because for the first time in a while, there's not, it seems like kind of a, a very clear and obvious air to who should be in this position. And also we have the political process itself changing a good deal while also dealing with the consequences and, and the environment of one party rule um, that we addressed in the last episode. Um, Patrick, how should our listeners kind of be thinking about going into the election of 1824? Where is America at at politically here? So America in the year 1824 is definitely at a crossroads, at least politically, where is it going to continue on with the National Republicans American system, you know, the cronyism of central banking, protective tariffs, internal improvements, nationalization of Western territories, and uh, aggressive foreign policy. This is the system articulated by Henry Clay, okay, so he's sort of the Hamiltonian of the era. Uh, Or is it going to go back to something along the lines of the original Republican Party, perhaps uh, even as far as what the old Republicans, John Taylor, John Randolph, uh, et cetera, wanted? So this is not the era of good feelings. Uh, it's, it's often described as uh, as this, the 1820s, just because there's one party. In fact, there was a lot of sectional strife. There was animosity. The Panic of 1819 had enormous uh, uh, repercussions in terms of uh, for re- regarding various policy related to tariffs, internal improvements, and central banking. And uh, you're you're starting to see, okay, what is going to happen to the country now that Monroe's gone? Who's going to be the next person that will become president? Will there only continue to be one party, the National Republicans? Uh, So you see in 1824, the first time really in American history that you you see a a, a, a four way race initially five way race between uh, multiple candidates they're all sort of vying for this next uh, position of the presidency but the election of eighteen twenty four is very important which is why I'm very happy that we're talking about it today well because that's one of the, the promising things here right is we've been talking about for several episodes now just how bad you know this Jefferson po- Jefferson party has become as the Republicans, right? You know, there, there is very little difference now. You now have the Republicans actively advocating for many of the good old Hamiltonian policies. And the good thing is there was a backlash to it, right? And and so what we see here is, is a very interesting and, and, and significant political change that happens within this country as a byproduct of the election of 1824 and the election of 1828, some of the successes uh, thereon after um, when we go into the election of 1824, we've, we've got four main characters among us in terms of candidates. Uh, we've got William Crawford, Henry Clay, uh, Andrew Jackson, and John Quincy Adams. And what, what the, the interesting one in this, and, and the one that our, our listeners are probably least familiar of, is you know William Crawford, who is seen as someone who could perhaps restore uh, that, that romantic Jeffersonianism to the political process. Um, Can you go into a little bit about Crawford in particular, um, since he's probably the, the least known of the other three? Yeah, so the the election of eighteen twenty four. Initially, there was not only those three. There was also John C. Calhoun, um, right? Right. Who, 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 yeah, who he later just decided to run for the vice presidency, which which he did win. Uh, but you, yeah, you have those five main characters, and out of those five, uh, you're you're definitely right that William Crawford is probably the least well known. This is uh, one of these is one one reason for this is is just due to historical. 
um, uh, just a historical accident in the fact that a lot of his uh, papers got burned in a fire a long time ago. So there hasn't really been many exhaustive biographies uh, where someone's able to look through all of his correspondence. You kind of, they kind of had to build it up through other through other sources. Uh, but William Crawford is incredibly significant. Uh, he was one of the um, old Republicans. Uh, so uh, uh, in, during the old Jeffersonian era, okay, so he was at least initially fighting against um, all of Jefferson's sort of descent into cronyism after the Louisiana Purchase. He was a Virginia native. He did move to Georgia, right? And uh, by the time of 1816, so after the uh, a- after the, the War of 1812, William Crawford was pushed by many old Republicans uh, to at least kind of carry on their 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 uh, their idea their ideals, right? Because Crawford he was a limited supporter of uh, central banking, protective tariffs, and internal improvements, but he still strongly believed in limited government. And he was uh, especially uh, being being very frugal, so you know, limited spending, which is very important to the old Republicans. And he wanted to run in 1816. We spoke about this. Uh, he, he basically decided not to, and then he did again, and Monroe won. Uh, and so Monroe became uh, – he won the Congressional Caucus, and then he became uh, president for eight years. So during this time period, William Crawford uh, most notably was – he was secretary of the, 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 the Treasury. And he was running in 1824. Uh, He was most championed by someone who was really, I kind of think of the brains behind the Crawford candidacy, more so than William Crawford himself, especially at one point when William Crawford uh, didn't really have much of a brain uh, or he was sort of incapacitated uh, during the election, which is a, just a great story that we'll, we'll, we'll get into. And that's Martin Van Buren, the little yes. magician from New York. Uh, he's a senator from New York, and he's really trying to recreate the old Republican sort of creed because uh, 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 Van Buren is upset at how the national Republicans have become very big government. Uh, and this has led to a uh, all, all, all sorts of all sorts of cronyism surrounding the American system. He wants to bring back party divisions because this is at, at Martin Van Buren wasn't perfect. He wasn't a perfect ideologue or intellectual, but he was extremely politically shrewd. And he wanted to sort of recreate a faction in favor of limited government. And he was pushing for Crawford as his preferred candidate. Yes, Van Buren, someone I definitely want to dive down a, a deeper in, and particularly his theories of political parties and and his organizational structure. Um, but before we we get into that, you know, um, one of the things I think is interesting is that you know you, you have multiple members of the same administration going at each other within this election. You have William Crawford, uh, who, who followed Gallatin as uh, the Treasury Secretary. I, I believe he started what under Madison, if I remember correctly. Uh, so, well, technically Gallatin left and then there was Alexander J. Dallas, right? He was okay. the, the guy, uh, he pushed for the central bank. Remember he was Astor's, uh, Astor and Gerard's lawyer, right? And then Dallas had to leave, I think for health. And I'm not sure if someone minor took up that position, but Crawford at the end of the Madison administration, he was in charge of the war department. And that's where the funny story, you know, the, regarding the Indians, ma- the interracial marriage and the Irish and all of that. Uh, then he became secretary of the treasury under Monroe. All right. And and then um, uh, you have in the position of, of real power, right? The, the the person you would naturally expect to be the the next man up in secretary of state position, which is the, uh, the position currently held by John Quincy Adams. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting in terms of the personality differences involved is that um, Clay and John Quincy Adams were both part of the negotiations of the, the for the Treaty of Ghent. And so they're here in a room together. And, and within this sort of personal dynamic, on the one side, you had Henry Clay, you know, who, who liked his alcohol and liked his gambling and was this very flamboyant, uh, womanizing sort of personality. And then you have John Quincy Adams, who, who was, you know, very, very much a, a quiet, serious, stern man who, who, you know, had these very deep diaries and, and just kept to himself. And so you, you have both of these that have experience, you know, uh, within, you know, kind of their circles overlapping. And then alongside of all of this, you have this, this upstart 
uh, rising from outside of politics, you know, now that the great war hero, Andrew Jackson, um, who after the great success with the uh, battle at New Orleans, ends up becoming a bit of a, a thorn in the side of the Monroe administration. And so between Crawford and Adams and Clay and, and also Calhoun, all four of these figures have to react to Andrew Jackson kind of as this growing political force outside of this circle. Um, can you talk a little bit about Jackson kind of in, going into this and, and you know, the, the consequences of some of his uh, adventures down in the Florida territories uh, and, and the international disputes that kind of came about with some of his actions? Yeah. So just to just sort of recap, like you said, I'm glad you're bringing it up. So everyone, it was, it was really the, 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 the election of 1824 initially was kind of a wrangling, if you will, between the various factions in the Monroe administration, who is going to follow the top boss, so to speak, right? Because you had John Quincy Adams, he's secretary of state, which was a position at the time that was really seen as a stepping stone into the presidency. Um, many other, the, the prior presidents, um, Monroe, Madison, uh, Jefferson, they were all, had all been previously secretaries of state. Um, you had Henry Clay, he's speaker of the house, technically not in the administration, but still a very important force. Calhoun was secretary of war. Crawford was secretary of the treasury. Uh, these are all, uh, important positions. And then you have Andrew Jackson, who's a senator from Tennessee. He's seen as a military general, doesn't really have too much experience. He was briefly a senator during the quasi-war uh, in the late 1790s. And he kind of comes across to these guys as, all right, he's just running on popularity. He's the famous general after New Orleans. Uh, he's just running on his his own popularity. This was the time, uh, the beginning in the 1820s, when many states had started to uh, embrace democracy more and shift away from having their state legislature um, uh, choose its electors. If you know, in the electoral college for the presidency, so Jackson, he was he was a people's man, and initially his record. You know, after the war, he um, he 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 was he was always a, a belligerent. You could say he was very involved in Indian relations, and he himself uh, later adopted an Indian an Indian child. Uh, but he realized that there were some problems between uh, settlers and um, and and the Indians, and the Indians claiming large tracts of land. Anyway, the, the long story short, he sort of goes off of he invades Florida when the Monroe administration clandestinely gave him support. They didn't want to give him outright uh, support. They wanted to do it secret because they knew what type of political backlash that this could bring. So sort of, okay, yeah, we're giving you the ability to do this. Jackson goes full hog. He takes over Florida. And the Monroe administration is, is, is very upset at this because, one, a lot of people sort of realized that, OK, um, he might be gunning for something bigger uh, than just being just being a general. Ironically, Adams defended Jackson because <laughs> Adams, the secretary of state, really wanted Florida. And he was OK with Jackson basically invading Florida and he justified it, saying the Spanish can't control their 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 their, their quote unquote savages, uh, the, you know, the Indians. And we need this for national security. So Jackson, uh, he was mainly known for invading, invading Florida during this time period. We later got Florida through the 1819 Adams Onus Treaty and he would sort of established a record for himself in this in in the Senate. He was anti bank. Uh, he was anti debt, but he had also signed on to the protective tariff of 1824 because it would pay off the debt. His candidacy in 1824 was not very ideological. It was mainly based off of popularity and charisma. But he still was definitely a force to be reckoned with among the other contenders. And, and one of the things I think is interesting is that. The Virginia dynasty, which has controlled politics for, for a very long time, even as the sort of the ideals of what we think about, right, when it comes to Jefferson and, and, and you know, those Virginians kind of went away um, and a lot, a lot of propagandizing from Madison afterwards. Uh, but they, they even though there, there was a lot of, you know, you, you can draw some historical parallels uh, between, 
you know, the, the Jacksonian era that we're about to go into and some of the romantic ideas of Thomas Jefferson. The, Thomas Jefferson was not a fan of, of Andrew Jackson, right? Uh, there's a quote, I feel mo- much alarmed at the prospect of seeing General Jackson president. He is one of the most unfit men I know of for such a place. And so one of the things that's kind of interesting is that when you have these personalities involved, as you mentioned, John Quincy Adams, who's this very, you know, this, this very you know, stoic, stern guy, was very defensive, uh, what was a lot more defensive and respectful of Jackson than some of these other figures, whereas Crawford, uh, Calhoun even criticized Jackson uh, during that period, which came out later during uh, a kind of a breakdown of relationships between the two of them. Like, it, it's, it's it, Adams and, and Jack, uh, Jackson, starting off with, have one of the more respectful relationships. And, and the concern for, you know, John Quincy Adams or Henry, Henry, Clay, Henry Clay, the person they feared was not Jackson, but Crawford. And, and you know, it's, it's very interesting, just, you know, since we know how this whole thing ends, that dynamic, I think, is very interesting. Um, and of course, one of the reasons why they feared Crawford so much is because of the growing apparatus kind of being, being, uh, developed there, um, before, uh, can, can we t- touch on just a little bit about Van Buren's background? Um, because before he becomes, he gets to DC, which he, uh, an area, which, which he, he doesn't really like what he finds uh, when he gets there, um, his, his, he really cuts his teeth within New York politics, opposing uh, the, the Clinton dynasty, right? And, and, and so he's he's a bit of an upstart. I mean, what, it's, it's pretty interesting that Van Buren himself doesn't come from a very privileged family. Um, again, we're now getting into that second generation of American politicians, and here you have a guy who was the son of a tavern keeper, who you know he's not a war hero, right? He, he doesn't have anything that he has kind of earned his merit on sort of those historical battlefields. Instead, he's done it by simply being a very shrewd uh, calculator within the legislative process. Um, him, his group is called the Bucktails um, within New York politics. And one of the things that they get that gives them power is that he's able to have great loyalty and discipline for those on his side. So you know, they, they were able to make sure that, you know, whatever his little caucus agreed on, even if you didn't like the outcome, you were going to vote lockstep with everyone else on this issue because doing so was the only way of being able to fight these very entrenched powers. And so when we get to where politics is now adapting, again, this coinciding with, uh, uh, you know, the, the political process itself becoming more democratic um, with a lot more, uh, you know, you know, uh, 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 you know, a lot more people, you know, you know, largely white men, having the ability to vote now, the necessity of, of really formalizing the party structure uh, ends up being very important to how these, you know, political battlefields go on within the second generation of politicians. Um, you know, can, can you touch on a little bit there again, you know, w- what is Van Buren bringing with him when he signs on with a Crawford uh, in 1824? Yeah, exactly. So, so great, great. Um, the you know the discussion, a good, a good jumping off point. We could talk about Van Buren. Uh, so Van Buren, he's he starts off uh, in he's in, in New York. Uh, by this time, the Clinton uh, faction. So George Clinton is dead. He was the anti-federalist governor in New York. He was uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he was uh, excuse, he was he, he was the famous. Um, the vice president who vetoed the, the bank in a, or at least he didn't veto the bank, excuse me. He, he cast the tie breaking vote in the Senate, uh, in 1811, preventing its recharter. He had gone, his nephew, DeWitt Clinton, uh, had, it was in charge and he increasingly supported more and more of the national Republicans program. So DeWitt Clinton was very famous for the Erie Canal, which was the seemingly successful state run, uh, public works program. And the, the, the Clinton faction, as you've mentioned, is uh, was sort of criticized by the emerging Bucktail faction for basically being too uh, too corrupt, too pro big government. They're losing kind of the cohesiveness of a party organization. It's more about the person at the top 
Clinton than the actual any sort of principles that they stand for. So Van Buren uh, organizes uh, what comes to be known as the Bucktails, also the Albany Regency, um, to create sort of a rival faction in New York that will stop Clinton uh, and the state level. And this is kind of a jumping off point for him organizing a much larger uh, organization on the federal level. So this is where Van Buren comes from. As I mentioned before, he's not a perfect ideologue. He is known as the little magician because he can be evasive or he's trying to straddle issues in order to keep his coalition alive. But it's fairly clear that uh, he is still in the limited government direction. And regarding his his main uh, usefulness to the reformers, it's that he is the great uh, you know, politico. He's the organizer. He knows how to get all the people together to you know create the party, so to speak. Because the actual party as an institutional structure, I think, is something a lot of people who are interested in politics now don't know about. Precisely because the party in the modern era has become so useless. Uh, this is why you always hear Democrats and Republicans are always the same. But parties back then, it was this was this huge thing because not only was this how uh, your know, patronage was how you got people interested, but it was the ideology that really kind of drove people to one party uh, versus uh, versus another. Right. So it was all about whipping up uh, the enthusiasm in your own group and getting them to come out and vote. So. This is this is this is where Van Buren sort of coming from. He wants to create a you know recreate the 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 old Republican program, and he sees Crawford as the best choice for that. Uh, at least you know after you know the the put things simply, he sees it as he sees Crawford as as the best choice for it. Uh, he's pushing for Crawford to become president in 1824. Uh, two things complicate Van Buren's plan when it comes to Crawford. The first is that Van Buren's strategy uh, was a shrewd strategy. Um, he was trying to just recreate the Congressional Caucus. He said, all right, well, uh, the Republican Party has always nominated its people through the Congressional Caucus, where congressmen just vote on who they want to be their candidate. So as long as I get Crawford to win in that, then, well, uh, we, you know, we, we win because the Federalists aren't going to aren't going to actually pose a serious threat. Um, but by this time, because of all the other factions, they're saying, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Uh, you know, you can vote on this, but that's just you. You know, this is not actually going to speak for everyone. Right. Because they knew Van Buren had the strength in Congress to actually pull it off. So Van Buren's main strategy didn't work. Um, and the other thing was that Crawford got sick. He, he, he got a stroke and he was basically paralyzed. Uh, he had trouble speaking. Uh, there was uh, movement mo you know, mo issues, et cetera. Uh, and Van Buren, um, which I just, I just find great. He's like, well, we're still going to run. You. <laughs> <Right>. Like <laughs> he's still, so I just think of this as sort of the a original weird, Joe Biden strategy. Yeah. It's the original Joe Biden strategy, or it's sort of like a weekend at Bernie, you know, we, we, weekend at Bernie's, right? That's the old move from the eighties. It's weekend at Van Buren's, you know, he's propping up William Crawford and, or it's the old Joe Biden strategy where, uh, you have someone who probably shouldn't be running for president, but the powers that be are well, still pushing you to run for president. Um, it was Van, what was Van Buren doing, but he was trying to reform the system. So I, I give him credit for that. Um, and so that, that kind of hurt, uh, the, the, the Crawford candidacy <laughs> or the Van Buren, the Van Buren strategy in, in 1824, but he played a much bigger role after the election of 1824. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, it's interesting because you know, one of the things I love is that a, a debilitated Crawford, um, still gets more electoral votes than Henry Clay which considering how much I, I love Henry Clay, I just got that, that, that is something that's just, that's, that's, that's good karma just working against the, you know, that, that is really, that really had to be a blow. It, like knowing that Crawford was debilitated yet you still <laughs> lost to him. He got third and you got fourth, like in the act that, that, that's, that's just gotta be tough. Yeah, like there's, it, that's, you know, uh, particularly I mean, like the, the, some of the descriptions that I've read in some of these other books, like it, they, 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 I mean, this wasn't just like a stroke, we're like, you know, you come back a little bit slower yeah. afterwards. Like, no, like this, this was, a, this was, was bad. Out. He was uh, out. Uh, and, and, and so uh, one of the things I think is interesting about the way that Van Buren views, his, views politics that, that I think is, is part of all of this is that he, he views this process as being absolutely vital for a republic to have success. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a quote here that parties 
They rouse the sluggish to exertion, give increased energy to the most active intellect, ex excite vigilance over the public functionaries, and prevent that apathy which has proved the ruin of republics. And so he, he you know, this, this the entire idea that we must infuse, we must create a, a structure that will engage with the normal people, inform them of the right way of thinking about things, you know, instructing them ideologically, and then organizing them in a way to, uh, to act afterwards. Again, 1824 is, is kind of the, the, the original run for what's going to become the Jacksonian Revolution in, in four years from now. Um, but again, I, just, I think it's interesting, though, because when we think about this Jacksonian party, it really begins not with Jackson, but with Van Buren, with this original run with Crawford. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And, and so now let's, let's get a little bit into the, some of the sectional differences here, because, you know, obviously, um, you know, with the way this entire thing plays out, um, Henry, Henry Clay, for the most part, is an afterthought in this entire process, though he becomes very powerful here, here in a moment. But when it comes to actual um, um, popular support, uh, Clay is, is a distant fourth within this. Um, did, did he carry a state? Um, uh, I, think he yes. might, I think he got Kentucky. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, he, so he, he, he did. He did. Okay, so but but um, uh, so like, but ja Jackson has support within um, the south, much of the south and the west. Mm -hmm. um, Crawford is supported within Virginia and Georgia, um, getting the backing of, of some of those old school Jeffersonians in, in Virginia, and then him, him, he himself being a product of Georgia. Um, uh, John Quincy Adams obviously has success within those old Federalist. Um, parts with within uh, uh, you know, New England and that era, and again, I, I think it's just interesting here where you know for the first time you know th this isn't a binary process. You have four competing factions with their own regional strengths, um, you know, now going after this seat of power, um, w w which leads us to a, a solution that is not solved through the election process. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Um, the, 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 it turns into a doubt to be a, a four way horse race because once Jackson actually announces his candidacy, Calhoun basically realizes he's out. Um, and, and, in this, this just causes him to run, run for the vice presidency. And so then you have the results of the election where Jackson, uh, commands a plurality in the electoral college and in the popular vote, but he doesn't have a majority. So what happens after that is it goes to a House overtime election. Ironically, when the founding fathers were devising the Constitution, they actually thought that most presidential elections would go into uh, this overtime uh, uh, um, election, where basically each state delegation in the House of Representatives would vote uh, and cast their choice to, for, 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 for the presidency. They did not at least is the way the standard uh, narrative goes. They did not foresee the rise of political parties where you would would only have like two people uh, running or two major people running. They always thought it would be a lot of people and then the House would always decide. Ironically, the only two times, the only two elections in which the House actually decided, the election of 1800 and the election of 1824, the country got very close to uh, in getting you know, the country was enraged and or was on the the verge of a revolt in case of the election of 1800 when the Federalists were trying to deny uh, Jefferson the election, uh, the presidency and, and swing it to Burr uh, or in the election of 1824, which a lot of people were upset at over the corrupt bargain, which we'll talk about. So I always just find that funny. It just shows you how much uh, the actual presidential elections now are very different from uh, how they were envisioned to be uh, before. Um, <clears throat> so during this uh, process, Jackson, he, 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 he's in the lead, but he doesn't have enough. So after the uh, election process was amended in the 12th Amendment, the top three candidates go uh, to the House. So they go to the overtime election where the state delegations will vote on who will be president. And poor Henry Clay, uh, he loses out to a man who has a debilitating stroke. So he comes in fourth and he is he, he cannot participate or he cannot at least run. 
So he, he, he lost the playoff game. He's got to watch the rest of it on the sidelines, right? Uh, but, <laughs> but he does realize he can at least decide who will become president. Um, you know, because he has enormous influence in the House, being uh, the Speaker of the House. And he sees that, OK, he he hates Crawford um, and he, he, he doesn't like Jackson. So he sees that John Quincy Adams is going to be uh, his preferred choice. So basically what Clay and Adams agree on in late December 24, early January 25 is sort of a I'll scratch my back. You scratch, uh, you know, excuse me, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back, right? Which is, look, make me, Adams, I'll make you, Clay says to Adams, I'll make you president in the House if you make me sec your Secretary of State, with the implication that as being Secretary of State, Clay will become president in eight years from now. So basically, Adams and Clay decided to thwart the popular will so to speak, um, to choose the person who did not get the plurality in the um, uh, in, in, in the in either the popular vote or the electoral college, and instead give it to Adams. Yes, again, I, again, Clay Clay's able to really kind of he, he plays this off very well uh, behind the scenes. The, the problem is, however, is, is that you know, it, in in many ways because it is so obvious what clay does here this, this ends up being a mark against him uh in, in many ways uh you, this is not the, the the last time henry clay <laughs> runs for this office um but but he, he clearly kind of obviously outs himself as part of of uh you know the, the sort of cabal style politics that is you know pe people don't particularly like um and one of the things I, I think is interesting as well is that um, uh, when it comes down to the congressional votes, um, the state of North Carolina actually flips from Jackson to Crawford um, in, in some of those backroom deals there. So again, this entire thing plays off very, very interestingly. Um, one of the other dynamics to it is that uh, you know th there's a lot uh, to be said about Jackson's uh, view of running for president during this time. Like he, he's, he's kind of like, well, while there's always a little bit of this game, particularly during this period that you, you're, you're never running, right? Like, you know, it was seen as being beneath you if you actively campaign. You know, there, there is still, you know, mm -hmm. Jackson might've been less interested in the presidency than some of the others, particularly someone like Clay. But after this, you know, he, you know, he, he now feels that this position was stolen from him in these backroom deals. Um, you know, where, where Clay in particular was, was identified as, as one of the ringleaders too, which kind of, you know, the, the one person who, uh, you, you don't really want to end up on their enemies list is, is Andrew Jackson. Um, he, he's someone that can, that can actually uh, make you pay for that down the line in a variety of different ways. Um, yeah. but, but so all of this ends, and now we have, you know, I, I think it is the proper uh, conclusion of this era of good feelings that the son of the first partisan federalist president uh, is, is now, you know, the, the last uh, representative of this old you know, Republican party that had just slowly corrupted into itself. And, and then can I right off the get go, uh, John Quincy Adams begins with you know, at the at the de you know, we, we now have the State of the Union address, and it's a big you know speech given in front of Congress at the time. It's it's a written uh, a statement by the president to Congress. But right from the get go, while there is something to be said about the um, you know, obviously there's a there's a tremendous amount of hypocrisy within the language used by people like Madison and Monroe in the past. You know, that there's some of these rhetorical games going on where they still kind of pay, pay lip service to these old school Jeffersonian values while still acting like a Hamiltonian. Well, now like John Quincy Adams goes full mask off and outlines, no, you know, we are going to use the government to make investments for the common good. You know, we're, we're going to build up universities like they have in Europe. And that's, the, that's another one of these things here that, that I think is worth noting is that, you know, John Quincy Adams is a man who has spent most of his adult life not in the United States. You know, so, so he's a product of, you know, American aristocracy sent off to Europe with a, ver a very long and distinguished uh, a diplomatic career. 
um, but very much a product of Europe. And so here he comes and he outlines a, a very explicit plan uh, to you know just amplify all of these internal improvements and other cronious projects right from the get go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the the a- Adam is is a firm proponent of the American system. So he supports central banking. He supports protective tariffs, especially now that by this time in the 1820s, New England has is fully moved away from becoming sort of mercantile um, uh, you know, sh- shipping interests to uh, supporting full on manufacturing. This is a lot of this is from the Boston Associates, many of whom uh, donated uh, to John Quincy Adams election. Uh, he's also a firm proponent of internal improvements to sort of bind the, 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 the country together. And so he starts off. So not only are a lot of people kind of upset at how that uh, election turned out, um, that the, the overtime house election and particularly at the speed, most people thought that it would be something that would take several rounds of, of, of balloting. But what happened is basically Adams and Clay more or less, uh, went to about, um, uh, six, uh, state delegations and they were able to pry, you know, basically ply their, um, the, 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 the relevant congressman with, uh, special favors and, oh, okay. Uh, if you, if you vote for Adams, then we'll do something for you, et cetera. These are all these mini little corrupt deals. And so then Adams becomes, uh, president that way. So people are upset at that. And then he, as you mentioned, he gives this speech is his, 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 his opening speech. And he's talking about all the stuff the government's going to do and how they need to, we need to fund national, uh, you know, na- national, uh, um, uh, observatory and, and all these internal improvements. And he has this famous line. I believe it's, it's something along the lines of, um, Liberty is power. He says that. So it's like, he's, 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 he's contradicting the Liberty versus power theory. Um, and this caused uh, Jackson many years later in uh, in a veto. He he said money is power, which is I, I like that. He's sort of commenting on old old John Quincy Adams get get getting him after all those years. And so a lot of people were upset at that. So Adams starts off his administration basically realizing that he doesn't have much of uh, at least a significant part of Congress's support. People are upset at him. Um, in 1826, he loses um, the, the 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 he loses the midterm elections to sort of this rising Jacksonian coalition. This is the first time that the party in power had lost control of Congress, uh, or the sitting president had in in, in in an interim election. So this is this is this is pretty big. And uh, Adams and Clay, they they're they're, they're working together, uh, trying to continue to enact their their American system. But the problem is uh, Jackson's upset, as you mentioned. Jackson was, f- was furious at this. He thought that this was the ultimate uh, treachery. He had this famous line, something along the lines of, he "said the, the Judas of the West has closed the contract and has received this thirty pieces of silver. Uh, his end will be the same." So he's basically like, "I'm taking you out, Clay." You're, you're like, how dare you did you, 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 you do this to me and I'm taking you out Adams, uh, as, as well. And so you've got Jackson, who's very upset. He wants to run in 1828 and Martin Van Buren, uh, real recognizes a profit opportunity because he says, look, Jackson, uh, his, you know, Jackson, your campaign in 1824 was mainly based off of your personal popularity. Why don't we uh, bring you under the banner of the old Republican creed? Uh, you're sympathetic to it. Uh, you you were very close with Nathaniel Macon of North Carolina, one of those old Republicans of, of, of years past. Uh, you're anti-bank, anti-central banking, anti-debt, uh, limited government man yourself. Uh, why don't we run uh, your campaign on these principles, which will get even more people interested? So Van Buren starts to embark upon this really, really uh, tough, but I would say, and Murray Rothbard would say as well, a uh, heroic um, uh, 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 process of organizing this entirely new coalition and doing it in, in, in two years. So the Republicans back in the 1790s, they had started to organize in the mid 1790s. Jefferson ran uh, in 1796. He lost that. Then they really started to organize in 1800, and then they won that. 
Uh, Van Buren basically does this all within one election cycle. And so he's able to uh, deliver Jackson the, the victory. And so this is this is a very important thing that I don't think a lot of people understand, uh, because in order to succeed in politics, you have to have the right political infrastructure. You have to have the right uh, party system. And Van Buren recognizes this. He recognizes the need to build coalitions. He recognizes the need to uh, you know bring all of these people together under the banner of Jackson and you know fighting the American system, et cetera. And this is exactly what he does. So he starts to enlist. All of the various, um, uh, all of the various factions, and he brings them under the banner of Jackson. So Murray Rothbard always spoke very highly about Van Buren's efforts. He was very influenced by Robert Ramini, a Jacksonian historian, and I think that Martin Van Buren's uh, creation of this new party is extremely important, um, particularly because it's still the modern Democratic right. Party. The same party organization, the Democrats now, uh, that was basically created by Van Buren. Now, the party stood for very different things. In fact, probably like a complete 180. It was supposed to be a reform party designed to uh, limit government. But, you know, the creation of that party is absolutely Van Buren's doing, and he should get an enormous credit for that. Well, and, and some of the infrastructure that he recognized was important is that we, we, you had to have a series of newspapers. Right, because the newspapers informed and gave the partisan perspective of the current events, and because if, if you're not engaging with the common people, if if you're not having, they viewed the party process as a two way street. So you you have the party line that's going out there, you have you know, that's organizing, you know that, that's inspiring people within these their own communities to to you know get everyone together to make sure they sure they show up to vote. You know, the the purpose of the political process. Was it sort of the most vulgar aspects of politics? You know, you, you know, in, in today's parlance, right? Partisanship is is like a slur. At the time, it was simply a a way of trying to make these things matter, you know, to to actually make the ideas a potent uh, part of the political process by by having a system of discipline. And, and this plays out again. You know, Rothbard's commentary on on this process. Uh, I, I know there's a uh, uh, sort of great chapters in the progressive era book um discussing it within the context of the third american system uh, third american party system but sort of similar dynamic there um you know these aspects i, I think are, are really so interesting and then also with the creation of this broader network of newspapers is when we start having you know come on to the the scene uh, a lot of those these intellectuals that we mentioned a little bit last episode and, and will continue to play a role within the jacksonian era where it provides a platform for individuals thinking about economic ideas, thinking about the proper relationship between state and individual, um, you know, thinking about these aspects. Newspapers were the format to have into you know to, to get your ideas out there in a popular way, and so again, the, the, you know, we we can take these parties for granted now because we've you know this is what we've had ever since Van Buren get it started. But at the time, though, it, it was a means of getting you know, for people that now have the ability to vote to inform them of these things. And that that educational aspect, you know, you know, for for it's easy to sort of caricature Jackson as just sort of this blood soaked monster and and whatever. But ultimately, the Jacksonian success was what really was a triumph of ideas. Um, again, with the with the the use of this nationally popular figure as a vessel um, to promote a, a very uh, deep um, imp an important agenda, particularly from this perspective of liberty versus power. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm glad you brought that up because my book uh, Cronyism, I, I talk about how. Uh, one, these the, the, the Jacksonians utilized the newspaper to try and communicate their party ideas to the common man. I'm sure we'll talk more about like the Washington Globe and, and, and the other uh, Jacksonian uh, periodicals and, and 
intellectuals who were uh, trying to communicate the message to the average person. Uh, and, you know, really, that was how sort of this new battle between liberty versus power would be fought now, because uh, Jackson, uh, you know, at least, excuse me, before there, we only had the one party system of the National Republicans. So it was just power. And that's why you saw this huge increase in cronyism uh, develop sort of snowball during the Jefferson administration uh, and continue in the 1820s uh, during the, the so-called era of corruption. Uh, but then once you see this Democratic Party arise, and I know it's going to be hard for our reader, our listeners, that the Democrats, you know, they're the they're the good guys. You know, they're the reform coalition. Uh, it's, it's, it's completely different, uh, you know, d- different back then. Um you know, they're fighting against power, the National Republicans, who later morph into the Whigs of Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, John Quincy Adams, etc. So you see this liberty versus power dynamic, right? You have power up here, and then liberty sort of uh, comes back after the election of 1824, and especially in the election of 1828, where Jackson, he's riding on this reform retrenchment uh, in, in, in the economy program. And he, he, he totally de- de- demolishes John Quincy Adams in this election. So you're, you, you, you see, thanks to Van Buren, uh, the development of the appropriate infrastructure that allows the Democrats in the succeeding, uh, in the succeeding administration of Jackson and beyond to go farther than what the Jeffersonians did and actually, uh, start to take down, uh, some cronyism in significant ways. So it'd sort of tear down the American system because I'm very sympathetic to the Jeffersonians. I think that Thomas Jefferson dropped the ball in a couple areas. His first administration was pretty good, but it quickly went uh, to, to, to crap after that in his second administration and in Madison. The Jacksonians get a lot more stuff done. And I think this is something that gets overlooked. And this credit should be given to Jackson. Credit should be given to Van Buren. Credit should be given to the all the other Jacksonians, which I'm sure we'll talk, or we'll talk about. They weren't perfect, but they actually did – in the years they were in power, dismantle the American system. They were by far the most successful libertarian, laissez-faire, free market political force in uh, American politics, both past and present. Uh, probably won't be repeated, unfortunately. Uh, but so this this political process, you know, politics is very important when you're studying economic legislation because that's how po- that's actually how the economic legislation gets passed. So thanks to Van Buren creating this necessary infrastructure, you're actually going to see the Jacksonians accomplish a lot more than what the Jeffersonians couldn't do um, in, in, you know, in, 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 in Jackson's administration. I also love this dynamic, and I think it is very, again, particularly given the time period, but, you know, this really is like your average American saying, like, you know, we don't need you, you fancy pants New Yorker, New England elite. Right, like even back then, you still have this dynamic where you know, like it, it's you can know, now that we're in this era, and, and it's important to you know to understand that you know, you know often you know, you hear the phrase Jacksonian democracy and things like that. The democratic aspect of this was independent of Andrew Jackson, right? It, it wasn't that Andrew Jackson came in and made changes to give the common man more more right more uh, power in the political process. The the it, it's the changes that were happening to that political structure helped fuel a Jacksonian campaign where he might have otherwise had no chance if it was the old school, you know, congressional caucus, very much controlled system. Um, but I also just love like that dynamic going from a, a Quincy Adams to a, a Andrew Jackson just really reflects the changing of the times there. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to dive too much into the Adams administration itself. You know, I, I think a, a large part because you know, a lot of uh, the the issues with it um, have been very common themes at this point in terms of uh, the internal improvements and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, I did want to point out one particular scandal uh, that John Quincy Adams had. Uh, he bought for the White House a billiards table, uh, which, which might be the most interesting thing about John Quincy Adams. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that that was his man of the people moment right there. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but but uh, but he he was uh, attacked for bringing in gambling equipment 
uh, into the White House. Again, that, that will be the strongest point in his favor, uh, it, 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 in my own opinion. Um, I also think it's interesting that um, uh, there, there's this great, great quote. There's, there's a fascinating book on this period called The Birth of Modern Politics, uh, Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, and the Election of 1828. Uh, by Lynn Hudson Parsons, um, which is a fun read. But going into this dynamic between um, uh, Clay and John Quincy Adams, um, and again, when when, when, Clinton, when when Henry Clay was made Secretary of State, like that, I, that was one of those decisions that hurt both men um, because of how vivid the corruption was. But I, I did like this. Um, it talks about John Quincy Adams' opinion of Clay generally. Um, the quote was, uh, "As for Clay, uh, uh, quoting." Quincy Adams, like almost all the eminent men in the in this country, Clay was only half educated. Uh, in addition, he had a reputation as a gambler, a drinker, and a womanizer. But Clay had large and liberal views of public affairs, and that his principles relative to inter internal improvements would produce results honorable and useful to the nation. Um, and I, I think this is interesting only because again, th this shows the mentality that someone like John Quincy Adams was operating with during this time period, is that you know, they really believed that in spite of you know, perhaps all the internal failings, you know, the per what they viewed as personal failings of Henry Clay, the fact that he, he was someone that you know, would probably be fun to go out with, it, it, you know, they really saw that interest in getting over that successful changing of the Constitution by the Jeffersonians, uh, you know, at least in, in the Romantic period, of, of making that that constricting document Someone like John Quincy Adams saw someone like Henry Clay being willing to be as enthusiastic within you know this American system, within this this you know the, the system of, of internal impairs and, and all internal improvements and all that money funding. And they thought this was vital to uh, uh, the well-being and and you know cohesion of the country. And and I, I think you still see this very similar dynamic play out in modern politics today where you still have a political process. Again, the regime itself believes that it's important to keep funding and, and fueling all these great projects of the regime because you know, by their power, they can make otherwise, you know, backwards hicks and, and, and the uneducated and whatever, they can kind of bring them into a, a, a more noble and proper way of doing things. You know, they, they really were motivated by this crusade to keep this system in place and again, that's why the success of a, a Andrew Jackson with a Martin Van Buren coming in and knocking out this entire process. Again, these two elections are just absolutely fascinating from historical historical perspective, and I think they are vital to understand. They're they're vital for, for us to understand for anyone interested in political solutions to what we have now. Because even though eighteen twenty four you know, you know, might as well be, you know, 5,000 years ago rather than, you know, just about 200 um, in terms of the way we think about the world. There, there still very much is this aspect where, you know, a lot of these aspects of, of this populist politics are kind of just baked into us, you know, just kind of that kind of inhuman emotion and the way that we respond to things. You know, some of this stuff is timeless, you know, in, in spite of how far back we're really going to here okay. in terms of political yeah. strategy. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, the, the election of 1824 has a lot of parallels uh, with the modern era. Again, a lot of people were complaining about the election of 2020 uh, as being corrupt or stolen, et cetera. And, you know, that's a whole separate conversation, obviously, but it still uh, is in many ways echoing uh, the, the election of 1824 uh, and how that was a corrupt bargain and the election was, was stolen, so to speak, because Adams and Clay, I'm glad you brought up the, democrat the democratization issue. Adams and Clay drastically misunderstood the situation they were in, that it wasn't the situation of decades prior where most people didn't vote. This suffrage of your average person was seen as a right, and this was uh, very, very much an affront to them that uh, they're the popular will a quote unquote would 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 be thwarted basically through this um, this overtime you know election uh, finagling and, and all of that and so it's it, it is important I think to 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 understand the election of eighteen twenty four not just from the perspective of American history but also from the the modern era 
And I wish more people, you know, would would understand it uh, because I think, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly does rhyme. And I personally think we're due for another overtime House election sometime. And I hope that does happen because it would probably would, you know, I think the country would probably would just would, would just get destroyed. But it's a lot harder now in the modern two party uh, era. But I think somewhere, some way, somehow uh, it will happen. Um, who knows? And one last thing, just because it, it does, it, 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 you know, it, it's something that does have an impact on on Jackson in a variety of ways going forward. Um, when we're looking at the election of 1828, um, something else that's notable and, and, and perhaps very modern in, in many ways is that it was a very nasty election. Um, the most famous incident, of, of course, is the attacks on uh, Andrew Jackson's wife, Rachel who had, was previously married, um, uh, believed that she, that her husband had divorced her, married Andrew Jackson. And then it came out that there was no legal, you know, that, 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 that she was not legally divorced. And so they accused her of, of uh, you know, polygamy and all this sort of stuff. Um, she ends up dying shortly after, um, you know, after here. And, and so that's something that Andrew Jackson, you know, again, a man you do not want to tick off. Um, obviously, is very emotional about. Um, you had attacks uh, that they had this mailer um, that was just very bold of uh, uh, highlighting coffins and and crediting Andrew Jackson, um, uh, kind of trying trying to hold him, uh, attack him for execution of deserters um, you know, d- during some of his military uh, uh, crusades. Um, they attacked him with the negative opinions that Thomas Jefferson had of him. So this was also a time where, you know, again, part and partial to the the, the, the democratization of the political process, um, we have we're going from a time where you do not where you even you know it, it, it is it is seen as as uh, uh, you know beneath your dignity to even actively campaign. We very quickly go from that in 1824 to outright mudslinging and and dirty politics and and all of these sort of of tools of the trade going right there from the start, um, yeah. Yeah. which again I think is just interesting and in, and in kind of you know seeing the history of American politics. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, the, the politics could be very bitter then, a uh, bit bitter back then as it is now. Uh, partisanship was alive and well. Uh, but, you know, this is it, it was it, it, you'd only see the battles continue on, especially once the Jacksonians were in power and they actually started to dismantle uh, the, the the system. But really, with this election, as you know, in, in my own book, this is kind of like the last major uh, election or sort of revolution, as I call it, similar to the revolution of 1800. You have the revolution of 1828 because this was the uh, this is when the opposition had taken control. And just like the Jeffersonians had the ability to reform the government. Now, with Jackson at the helm, the Jacksonians have the ability to reform the government. Well, so after several episodes of things getting worse and worse and worse in early America, we are now at something that I, I think I, I know Patrick and I both believe is, is a positive uh, uh, event with the election of Andrew Jackson in 1828. Uh, I look forward with the next episode of going into some of the highlights uh, of the Jacksonian regime and, and some of their own political theories um, and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I tell that, that the, our, our next Jackson-filled episode um, this has been another episode of the Liberty versus Power podcast. Um, if you do not have a copy yet of Cronyism, uh, again, you can get you know, there's a, a discount code at the Mises Bookstore, which is code LVP. Please like, rate, review, like, and share. Uh, we've gotten again, some good, great feedback about this series. Again, you know, please you know, hit me up on Twitter if you'd like the show. Send me an email, whatever. Um, and uh, you know, thank you for watching, uh, Patrick. Any last words as we? Uh, yeah. We conclude here. No, nothing. I I, I think you hit on all the points. Uh, you know, you, you you make make sure if you haven't gotten your copy of Cronyism, get it. Uh, and also make sure to uh, follow uh, both Tho and I on Twitter and, and comment about it and promote it. We really appreciate all of your feedback. I'm very grateful that there's 
this many people interested in what both of us have to say about American history. Um, and this is especially the fact that there's a video of us. So if you're not scared with either of us and how we look, then this, this really shows that we're, 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 we're talking about um, important ideas. So again, uh, thank you so much for listening to the podcast and I hope you are enjoying it. See you next episode. Oh, geez. Oh, oh. Uh, Tommy, Tommy, what are you, what are you saying?